Hello and welcome to Counterpunch Radio. My name is Eric Dreitzer. Thanks so much for tuning in, coming back to the show. First time listeners finding the show, welcome aboard. Always happy to have you. If you are watching a video on Counterpunch Plus, we are so grateful for your continued support. It means the world to us as we try to bring these independent left perspectives on all sorts of issues. Uh, Counterpunch has been doing this for almost 30 years. We plan on a lot more years in the future, hopefully with your support. Go to counterpunch.org and get yourself a subscription to Counterpunch Plus. That is the best way to support what we do and to support the kinds of people that Counterpunch likes to support and perspectives that we want to bring to you, including my wonderful guest that I have with me today. He is a friend of Counterpunch. We love all of his work. It is Marcus Redeker. Marcus Redeker is a distinguished professor of Atlantic history at the University of Pittsburgh. He's written a number of books, all of which you absolutely need to get copies of. I'm just going to highlight a couple. The Slave Ship, A Human History, really profound and important book, as well as the more recent recent, The Fearless Benjamin Lay and Profit Against Slavery, Benjamin Lay, a graphic novel. I believe that was uh, co-written with our friend Paul Buell. So anyway, Marcus, welcome to Counterpunch. Thank you, Eric. It's great to be with you. I love Counterpunch and uh, really happy to be a part of your program. Thank you so much for that. We love all of your work. It's always a joy every time I get to see something with your name on it on Counterpunch. So Marcus, if we could just jump into our conversation uh, as an introduction for people who maybe aren't familiar with your work, uh, you really, I guess you could say you sort of frame your sort of method of thinking as history from below, as you call it. Can you explain what history from below means and why you think it's really an important idea? Yeah, history from below, Eric, is a, an approach to studying the past. Uh, it goes by several names. It can be called radical history or people's history in the famous instance of Howard Zinn. It's basically uh, an approach that treats ordinary working people not only as subjects of history, but as makers of history, as agents of history. Uh, I would say that history from below has an anthem. And that anthem is a poem by Bertolt Brecht, uh, A Worker Reads History, uh, the first three lines of which are, Who built the seven gates of Thebes? The books are filled with the names of kings. But was it kings who hauled the craggy blocks of stone? And there you have it. The top-down history features the kings, the philosophers, the statesmen, the great men. History from below stresses the importance of the people who actually built the world we live in. Its material foundations uh, created the wealth of the world. Uh, And I do think there are several important elements in history from below. Not only that uh, we concentrate on working people, but that we deal with issues of power, uh, exploitation, oppression, and crucially resistance all in relationship to each other. Uh, History from Below is also about understanding uh, experience, the experience of working people, the consciousness of working people. Uh, That's crucial. Recapturing the voices where we can. uh, And and most of all, as I mentioned earlier, uh, studying what working people do to free themselves. I think this is kind of a key. This is what uh, CLR James called self-activity of the working class. So, so these are the these are the key elements. I might add that the history from below is a very old tradition, uh, and I think the first time the phrase was used was in the 1930s in France. Uh, there was an explosion of history from below during the movements of the 60s and 70s, in which the civil rights movement, the Black Power movement, the anti-war movement, the women's movement. All of these began to demand new kinds of history, history that took race and slavery seriously, history that took imperialism seriously, history that took into account the larger part of humankind, that is, the female portion. So these movements uh, from below helped to generate history from below. And I think that's a really crucial point, that this kind of history originates from and, ha- and makes progress in relation to those kinds of movements. It's a, it's a kind of insurgent history. 
Yeah, I think that's very well said. Now, for our younger listeners and viewers, who are some of the influences who really put you on that path? You mentioned Howard Zinn. You've mentioned C.L.R. James. Are there any other historians that you came across as a student and in your earlier years that really drove you to understand it in that way? Yeah, there there are a great many. I think the three most important figures for me were, uh, first of all, C.L.R. James and his famous book about the Haitian Revolution called The Black Jacobins, uh, basically about how this movement on this small island in the Caribbean, uh, now known as uh, Haiti, uh, half the island anyway, had worldwide repercussions that historians had basically ignored. And what James did was to show how this army of self-emancipated people, formerly enslaved and was one of the richest sugar colonies in the world, uh, broke through and made a revolution and basically forced the rest of the world to deal with it. Uh, so, so James, I think, was an important figure. That book was written, published in 1938. So you get a sense of the, the longevity of history from below. Uh, a second book, and, and one that I think most people might consider to be the greatest history from below ever written, would be The Making of the English Working Class by E.P. Thompson, Edward Palmer Thompson, uh, an English historian. Uh, this is a book about the origins of the uh, working class in Great Britain. It's an 832-page classic. Uh, it's, it's a book that was published in 1963, but in truth, I think that book was actually made, if I may use that uh, that verb in 1968, when the worldwide movements actually began to discover the importance of this history from below and how ordinary working people made history. So that's a, a second book uh, by Thompson. And the third, and in some ways the most important for me personally, was a book by another uh, historian in England by the name of Christopher Hill. Uh, he wrote a book called The World Turned Upside Down. Radical Ideas in the English Revolution, published in 1972. And this was about this uh, extraordinary array of wild and colorful radical Protestant groups called the Levelers, the Seekers, the Diggers, the Quakers, and the way in which they, once royal censorship had broken down within the English Revolution in the 1640s, rushed into print with uh, solutions to all of the problems of their day, solutions to poverty, solutions to oppression. They denounced slavery. They denounced marriage. Truly an extraordinary group of radical ideas that my generation of the 60s and 70s thought we had invented. And it turns out these, uh, these ideas were uh, more than 300 years old. So this is a kind of intellectual history from below, a history of ideas from below. And I think that is a really important uh, way to think about this because uh, working people are not just uh, workers. They're not just doers or historical actors. They are also thinkers. And to recover their thought is a crucial part of history from below. Indeed. And to that point, I guess I want to ask you how understanding history in this way relates to our politics on the left, whether we're socialists, communists, anarchists, whatever we describe ourselves as on the left end of the spectrum, understanding history in this way, we don't do it just to understand history, to gain knowledge and facts. We then apply it to our understanding of today. Can you talk a little bit about sort of that connection between studying history in this way and connecting it to what we're actually experiencing in our time? Yes, I think uh, one of the things that history from below does is, is, first of all, demonstrate that in the past, there were a great many struggles for justice, for equality, for democracy that we just never knew about because of the way that history was written from the top down for so long. So history from below cannot, can, can not only it can enlighten us about other projects that might be similar to our own. Uh, one of the things, for example, that the diggers in the English Revolution did was to reclaim the commons, the privatized land, the enclosures in which many peasants had been you know, swept off the land and into wage labor. <clears throat> in a time when we have uh, 
a major issue with the commons, this kind of reading can be very useful. There have been struggles over the commons for a long time. And of course, uh, my friend and co-author Peter Leinbaugh, another friend of Counterpunch, has written about this uh, with great power. But I think uh, it's it's not enough just to be enlightened. <clears throat> History from below can also inspire us. In other words, we can see that people fought on about certain issues and have been doing so for a long time, and we are not alone. The struggles we wage in the present frequently have a history, frequently have proposed solutions that were never tried, so we can learn about that. So I think the key is to make this history as widely available as possible so that people can study it. Uh, C.L.R. James actually once said that people learn history best when they are making history. So making this kind of history from below available to new movements from below would be especially crucial because that's, that's kind of what they need, what they want at this time, new possibilities, new ways of thinking. So I, so I think these are some of the ways that history from below can help us from the present. The last point I would, I would say would be to emphasize something that C.L.R. James said. He says, find the struggles where working people are organizing themselves and join them. In other words, don't be a vanguardist and basically go into neighborhoods to tell people what they ought to be organizing about. Find groups of conscious, self-conscious, politically active people who are waging a struggle from below and then join it, watch it, learn from it, because those are the kinds of movements that are going to sometimes suggest new forms of organization, can suggest new ideas. Uh, all these things are crucial. And I think that's, you know, that's one of the things that, um, that we can do. Uh, my friend Staunton Lind has, has written a book about what uh, organizers, and in some cases, people with uh, more privilege can do in movements from below. And he draws upon an idea that was developed in the uh, liberation theology movement called accompaniment. In other words, that you accompany movements from below. You don't try to reroute them. You don't try to tell them what to do, but you add your skills, your knowledge, the things you can do. You accompany them on a road to social change. This grew out of uh, base community organizing in Latin America in the 1970s. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a good model. It's, uh, it's honest. Uh, it's democratic, and it's very respectful of the variety of movements that are out there. I think that's very well said. Now, um, just to keep our conversation going and help us understand your work, can you talk a little bit about, well, of course, you you have a general interest in history, obviously. You've written and spoken on many, many subjects, mm -hmm. a wide array, but you are, it's something of an authority on the Atlantic trade, on those, you know, the issues related to the slave trade and so forth. So can you talk a little bit about how you came to this particular subject matter, why you devoted so much of your career to uh, understanding that period, telling that history from below, and how it uh, connects to your politics? Well, you know, I... When I, I grew up in the South, I was uh, born in Kentucky, grew up in Tennessee and Virginia, um, went to uh, university as a basketball player, uh, dropped out of uh, school and worked in a factory for several years, and then finally went back to night school um, with, to finish my undergraduate degree and go on to uh, graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania. And when I did, I went with the intention of becoming a historian of slavery. This was, I thought, where some of the most creative work was being done in the early 1970s, uh, inspired by the, the civil rights and black power movement. Uh, that's what I intended to do. But when I got uh, into my studies, I, I started working actually on the history of seafaring people and pirates. Uh, and this became the first book that I wrote called Between the Devil and the Deep Blue Sea about sailors. Uh, it talks about the origin of the word strike, which uh, most people don't know is a maritime term. Uh, in London in 1768, the sailors in a wage dispute went from ship to ship, striking the sails, taking down the sails, which meant that the ships didn't uh, run, capital didn't accumulate, the working class had a new kind of power. Uh, but 
slowly after that book, I began to work my way back toward the history of slavery. And uh, the next book that I wrote was with Peter Linebaugh, The Many-Headed Hydra, uh, Sailors, Slaves, Commoners, and the Hidden History of the Revolutionary Atlantic. So this was a study of essentially class struggle beyond the nation state, uh, to a very large extent, interracial class struggle beyond the nation state. So this this became a very important uh, uh, experience for me, this work, and in some ways working with Peter has kind of set the agenda for all the books I've written ever since. The book that you referred to at the outset, The Slave Ship, A Human History, this is a book that I began to write uh, in the early 2000s, and that book, the idea for that book, grew out of political work I was doing on the case of the former Black Panther, Mumia Abu-Jamal. Uh, I was very active in uh, the effort to win him a new trial, and I would visit him quite frequently in uh, SCI Green uh, Prison, about 55 miles south of Pittsburgh. Uh, and we would talk. He, he was allowed one two-hour visit a week, and we would talk about history. And one of the things that we talked about was the moment when he got a signed death warrant passed through the slot of his uh, cell on death row, signed by the governor of Pennsylvania, uh, basically stating the day that he was supposed to die. And this this basically uh, sparked a discussion between us on the relationship between race and terror. Because the experience of race in the United States has often been uh, uh, an experience of terror. And I think uh, when uh, this kind of notice is passed to people on a highly racialized death row, it's a new instance of the use of terror. But that goes way back. You know, lynching was one obvious uh, instance of that connection. But at that moment, I realized that the uh, original link between race and terror was formed on slave ships, and that I could study that as a contribution to uh, uh, the kind of freedom struggle. So that's the book that I undertook to write. Uh, that book was published in 2007, um, and uh, it is a really it was a difficult book to write i'll be perfectly honest because those ships were such chambers of horror they uh the, the people who were on them suffered such extreme violence and such extreme terror uh that that's you know if you write history from below you've got to live with that and uh that that made it difficult but of course the the redeeming part of the story was that they fought back in almost every conceivable way. So, so this is the way in which I uh, wanted to contribute to what was then a kind of burgeoning new movement of abolitionism. Uh, it's gained a lot of uh, power since then, but to say that abolitionism begins with the enslaved, that it begins on board those ships, uh, the categories of race are formed on board those ships. Uh, so it's always been my goal to produce uh, history and knowledge that can be useful not only to historians but to activists. Absolutely, it is. And actually, in thinking about that book in particular, one of the other things I think that really comes across in terms of relevance is that it is both relevant to all of us who are, you know, for lack of a better word, the inheritors of colonialism and the colonial legacy and slavery and all of these things, but it's even more important, I think, to African people and African history, a history that's almost been concealed from them, their own ancestors sort of erased from their own history, right? One of the things that comes across in the documentary that you were involved in going to Africa and talking to people about some of these stories and collective memory and things like that is that a lot of issues getting brought up that have nothing to do with us, with white people, with European colonialists, but having to do with their own history and telling and understanding their own stories. Well, you know, Eric, one of the purposes uh, of the slave trade uh, as as it went on for almost 400 years, in which some, you know, 11, 12, 13 million people were loaded onto slave ships and some 10 million or so were unloaded alive on the other end 
of the voyage the, with the differential between those two numbers being those who died on the vessel and uh, their bodies were thrown over the rails of the ship to trailing schools of sharks. So, so there again, we see uh, the terror. But one of the purposes of this trade was to annihilate the individual identity of the Africans who came on board those ships. I mean, people were literally stripped of their names and given numbers. Man number one, woman number five, child number 13. This is the way they referred to them on board these ships. So culture stripping, the eradication of any sort of historical knowledge of who you were or are, was, a, was very much a part of the violent process of enslavement. Women, enslaved women on board these vessels would sing in this kind of plaintive uh, uh, sort of tone, these lamentations, recounting their histories, recounting their families, recounting where they were from. And of course, the slave ship captains found this intolerable. And these women would frequently be whipped in order that, that they should be shut up and thereby quickly forget their history. So, so since this is such a, I mean, the, the Atlantic slave trade is one of the most important processes in all of world history. You know, you, you can't imagine the world as it is today without it. Uh, but, I, but I think it's, it, is, it is really crucial to know that the recovery of the African side of the story is critical for understanding the humanity of the people who went through the slave trade. And this actually was the, the rationale, the guiding logic for why, after writing this book, The Slave Ship, I then moved on to write a book called The Amistad uh, Rebellion about the famous uprising, slave ship uprising of 1839, because that was a successful rebellion. I had studied uh, many, many uh, revolts on slave ships that were failures, and, and the, the decks of those ship, ships ran red with the blood of the leaders who were tortured to death in the aftermath of a failed revolt. But as I'm, I'm watching this and studying this, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, how did the Amistad rebels do it? How did they actually manage to organize a successful revolt and get away? Well, uh, I went and read all of the historical scholarship on the Amistad, uh, and I found that very few scholars had been interested in how they actually managed to wage the successful uprising on board the ship. Almost all the histories of that uh, event, the Amistad event, concentrated on the court case, which happened when, after the Amistad Africans were brought onto uh, the territory of the United States, they went through a series of show trials, and that was pretty high drama. I mean, I can understand why people wanted to concentrate on that. Uh, but here's the problem. In that telling of the story, the white abolitionists become the heroes. John Quincy Adams becomes the hero. So the purpose of my book was to say, uh, look, without the revolt on board the ship, John Quincy Adams has nobody to represent before the Supreme Court. So how did they make the revolt? And it turns out that the key to making the revolt had everything to do with who they were as people back in Sierra Leone, where in West Africa, where they had all come from. So they had been trained warriors because of the intensity of the wars around the slave trade during the 1830s. Their skill, their military skill was really critical to their ability to wage that uprising. So the key to this so-called American event actually lay in West Africa. So I think this is an illustration of your point about how recovering the African history behind the slave trade and slavery is critical. And I just would add, Eric, there's a lot of terrific research being done on this right now. This is, this is a very big creative theme in scholarship. Absolutely. And I mean, it you know, to use the terminology that we would be more uh, accustomed to today, it is the the history that you tell. It is an anti colonial history. It is a it is a revolutionary version of that history. It's not just a discrete uprising. It's an it's it's an examination of what it takes to accomplish that. 
Absolutely. No, I think this is this is a very important point. And 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 let us not underestimate the importance of a successful uprising. You know, because this is the thing, the 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 Amistad Africans proved that you can rise up and win. Now the Haitian Revolution had proved this on a grand scale 40 years earlier. But the the knowledge of that had been so terrifying to American slave owners they did everything they could to repress the knowledge of it. But here are this group of Africans arrive in uh, New Haven, Connecticut, having successfully captured this ship. This information went out like wildfire. Uh, it changed the abolitionist movement. More and more people of African descent began to join. Abolitionists began to direct uh, addresses to the enslaved people in the South, saying things like, you who would be free, must strike the first blow. So again, the resistance from below becomes crucial to any vision of emancipation. And of course, not to belabor the point, but we all, I think, know the history of policing in the United States, its connection to slavery, slave catching, things of that nature. So a lot of the issues that uh, we highlight in talking about the period of slavery, they are very much relevant to the movement to abolish police, defund police, uh, address police violence. A lot of different issues that we talk about today that are directly connected to some of these. This is the modern incarnation of the connection between race and terror, race and organized violence. Uh, the prison system is another such example uh, in which this, uh, this institution uh, is basically meant to, to, to serve a, a really violent purpose among dispossessed people. I, I gave a, a talk in uh, Auburn prison some years ago, and uh, one of the uh, incarcerated people came up to me after the talk and referring, gesturing to the prison itself. He said, you know, we call this the modern slave ship. Uh, and what he was saying was that uh, violent incarceration has been central to American history from the slave ship right up through the modern policing system and the modern uh, system of uh, imprisonment. So the, the linkages are very strong, and this historical knowledge can really help us to understand uh, how to approach issues of the present. Absolutely. Let's take a quick break. On the other side of the break, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some subject matter that you've recently been writing about and how that relates to a lot of the issues we're dealing with today. Um, on the other side of the break, I'll continue with Marcus Redeker. Again, the, the most recent books, uh, one of them co-written with our friend Paul Buell, that's uh, Prophet Against Slavery, Benjamin Lay, a graphic novel. Get yourselves a copy of that. We're going to continue the conversation after the break. Enjoy the music. Be right back. And we are back chatting with Marcus Redeker. If you haven't already done it, you could go ahead and just pause the podcast now, go to your favorite place to buy books and get yourselves a copies, copies actually of several of these books, especially if you have any young people, young scholars, burgeoning historians, anybody like that who's interested in these issues, these are the books to get because they will make it, they will make a permanent impact on their thinking, um, especially if you get them in their teens and their twenties. Um, okay. Marcus, I want to talk a little bit about uh, one of the subjects that you've recently been writing about and researching, Benjamin Lay. I will admit I was unfamiliar with Benjamin Lay before I came across your writing. So tell us who Benjamin Lay was, why he's important uh, historically, and why he's important for us today. Well, Eric, you're, you're like everybody else, because nobody had heard of Benjamin Lay. And I have to say, he's probably the most interesting figure in history that you've never heard of. I can say that to all your listeners. Uh, Benjamin Lay was a, a man born in Copford, England in 1682. He was uh, uh, born into a very humble family. He didn't have much education. He worked as a shepherd uh, and as a sailor. He went uh, from Copford to London where he sailed around the world for about 12 years imbibing the sailor's tradition of solidarity that grows up in a, a, a dangerous work environment. 
Um, Benjamin Lay then went to Barbados for a time where he confronted the system of slavery in its rawest uh, form. Uh, this, this happened in 1718, turned him into a, an abolitionist very early. Now, this is, this is almost three generations before uh, an organized anti-slavery movement emerges. So Benjamin Lay is, is really very, very far ahead of his time. Um, just to complete the, the sort of chronology, he goes back to England for a number of years, then he migrates to Philadelphia uh, in 1732, and he is absolutely infuriated to discover that a lot of his fellow Quakers own slaves. And so he basically makes it his life purpose to try to convince them through the most extravagant means you can imagine that they must not own slaves, that this is an evil thing to do. They've got to stop it and they've got to stop it now. Okay. So, so, so Benjamin Lay, uh, I also want to mention was a person who had dwarfism. He was about four feet tall. He also had a hunchback. So by our modern standards, we might consider him to be disabled. Uh, I don't know that he thought of himself in that way because he always seemed to be able to accomplish what he wanted to accomplish. Uh, but I do think his dwarfism was linked to his sympathy and understanding for other people who suffered oppression. Uh, I think this was part of it. His seafaring background was part of it. His idea was, look, everybody who works in hard circumstances deserves our solidarity. And who works in more difficult conditions than enslaved people on these plantations in Barbados or even among these urban slave owners in Philadelphia, they deserve our solidarity. We've got to fight for them. Okay. So Benjamin Lay actually was the leading figure for many years among Quakers. Uh, and he was actually disowned by Quakers for his radical anti-slavery activism. Okay. He was so disruptive. He practiced this guerrilla theater. He would, uh, on one occasion, he, he took uh, concealed blood inside an animal bladder, uh, tucked away in the secret compartment of a book. And then during a Quaker meeting where there were lots of the wealthy Quaker slave owners sitting around him, he runs a sword through the book and this fake blood comes gushing out and he sprinkles it on the head of the slave owners. And of course, he got thrown out for that and disowned and all the rest, but he never gave up. He always came back. He kept fighting. Um, but Benjamin Lay's presence in history was erased to a very large extent, first by Quakers, because they tried to deny his ministry on behalf of enslaved people, but secondly, by historians who really didn't think that someone like Benjamin Lay fit. You know, he was from the wrong class. He used the wrong methods. He had the wrong ideas. The ideas were too radical, frankly. Um, so it was very easy to kind of leave him out because after all, wasn't uh, anti-slavery an enlightenment proposition carried out by middle and upper class gentlemen? Well, no, it wasn't. And now we know that it wasn't. Now that we know uh, abolition movement was a multi-class movement, there was a lot of uh, pressure from below. Uh, in some ways, this was its greatest force. So that's why we didn't know about him. But, but look, here's why we need to know about him now, because Benjamin Lay was a very radical abolitionist, but he was also more than that. Benjamin Lay was a very class conscious man. He believed that wealth was destroying Quakerism and it was destroying the entire society by corruption, corrupting people, creating bad values. Okay, so he was class conscious. He was gender conscious. He believed in the uh, strict equality of men and women. He was race conscious, as I've already mentioned. He was environmentally conscious. Uh, he liked to say, beware rich men who poison the earth for gain. Now, folks, that sounded like something that was said last week. Right? He said this in 1738. And then finally, he was a vegetarian, actually a vegan before the word was invented, about 200 years before it was invented, and a proponent of animal rights. So he had a, a completely integrated 
radical worldview. Now, if you were to ask somebody today when they thought that combination of beliefs became possible to be conscious on issues of race, class, gender, environment, animal rights, they probably would have said maybe the 1970s. No, 1730s. 1730s. And there are actually some figures who go back even further into that radicalism of the English Revolution. So here's a very, very powerful revolutionary thinker that we didn't know anything about. Uh, and, and the point is not that somehow we are on his side in the past, but that he is on our side in the present. Uh, he can be an, an inspiration. We can look at how he did these things and try to learn from his example. So I, I do think he is a, a quintessentially a radical for our time. He really is. And it's an, an example, an exemplar, whatever you want to call him. But it's almost it's even more than that. And, and, and he is he is the counterpoint. He is the counter argument to the idea that the so-called founding fathers were not evil men who were just a product of their time, right? Well, they just lived in their time and everybody understood slavery was okay. And so you can't really make a moral judgment about Washington or Jefferson or whomever, because, you know, they lived so long ago. It's If they were in our present time, they probably would have different views. But when you read about Benjamin Lay, you're like, wait a second, no, this is somebody who lived before them who already understood these things. So they were willfully engaging in slavery and in exploitation and in all of these things. It turns upside down how we view our own, quote unquote, founding fathers. I, I couldn't agree more, Eric. I think it's very well said what, what you just uh, uh, stated. Uh, the truth is that the temper of the times argument was such that well, we let uh, Washington and Jefferson off the hook because everybody thought that slavery was a natural institution at that time. So we really can't judge them by modern standards. Well, let's judge them by the standards of Benjamin Lay, who was their contemporary, right? These ideas were fully available. I, I can't prove it, but I strongly suspect that both Washington and Jefferson knew about them. I, they, I mean, they both those guys went to Philadelphia. Um, he was very well known. Lay was well known for these uh, radical acts of guerrilla theater. I think he would have been terrifying to them. I think uh, they probably would have been very worried about running into him in person because he would challenge you and never back down. But I think, you know, what you stated is exactly the point. These radical ideas were present. They were there. And therefore, those who chose to be enslavers were just doing, they were consciously making their decisions based on their economic self-interest. They had other options, other possibilities, different ways of living, different ways of being. And this is another thing about Benjamin Lay. He believed that you have to embody your ideas in the way you live. It's not enough just to say that you uh, believe this, that, or the other thing. You've got to live it. So he lived in a cave. He rejected the corruption of modern life. He made his own clothes so as not to exploit the labor of a tailor or someone who grew the cotton or the flax. He made all his own food so as not to uh, exploit the labor of farm workers somewhere. He refused to eat sugar or to drink tea, which he knew were made, uh, sugar and tea made by exploited workers in Barbados and in India, right? So there's like a politics of consumption here. Uh, he knew all of these things and he lived the life. He lived the life. He lived, he said, you know, let, let your life speak. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi had a very similar idea, be, be the change that you want to see in the world. Uh, and I think Benjamin Lay did live in this way. I think this is yet another way in which he's quite ex inspiring. He, he said, we've got to live outside the capitalist marketplace. You know, we can't let the, the market determine the value of things, least of all people. Uh, because in truth, what Lay discovered was something that Karl Marx discovered or rediscovered 125 years later, which is that the commodity hides 
the exploitation required to produce it. You drop a little cube of sugar in your tea. You don't think about the Africans who made that sugar under violent circumstances. So that's why, uh, that's exactly why Lay came along and with others came up with this phrase, sugar is made with blood. So there's an example. The, the commodity is not an innocent form. Uh, it hides great exploitation and violence. So, so Lay, was, uh, Lay was a pretty fierce social critic and, uh, and, and courageous. Uh, we can learn from his courage. We can learn from his commitment. And we can learn, Eric, from his unceasing agitation. I think people on the left don't appreciate the art of agitation as much as, as they once did. That you have to agitate to, to force people to make political choices. In every meeting that Benjamin Lay went into, he drew a line. He says, here's the line. Are you for slavery or are you against it? There's no middle ground. You're either for it or you're against it. And a lot of people hated him for doing that because he put them on the spot. But he agitated and slowly he began to win people over to his point of view. And that's when the Quakers then started to become the first organization that would abolish slavery in their own midst. They had a debate about this for almost 100 years, from the first protest against slavery by the Germantown Quakers of 1688 until 1776, uh, the, the Quaker yearly meeting ruled that you cannot own a slave and be a Quaker. Benjamin Lay was crucial to all that, and, and I think that's a, that's a history worth remembering. I would also like to just commend you and and Paul Buell as well for the uh, the new book, uh, the graphic novel, partially because it's it's important content, but most importantly, I think too, because it maybe opens up this story and this history to a different kind of reading audience, uh, one that it may be maybe it's easier for younger readers or whatever it might be, but putting it into this different format and and, and providing this radical history using a graphic novel, I think is really important. So I uh, just wanted you to speak a little bit to the, the, I guess, the importance of popularizing the story of Benjamin Lay in as many different media as possible. Mm, yes, gladly. Um, I approached uh, my friend Paul Buell a few years ago uh, with the idea of turning this book, the one you mentioned at the outset, The Fearless Benjamin Lay, uh, into a graphic novel, and Paul and I began to collaborate, and he found uh, an extraordinary artist named David Lester, who is based in Vancouver, British Columbia, and whose previous work had been on the Winnipeg general strike of 1919. So uh, David understood the importance of Benjamin Lay as a radical thinker and actor very well. So Paul, David, and I worked together to, to essentially adapt this uh, scholarly biography into a graphic novel. And I, I think David just did a tremendous job creating uh, powerful images. And of course, this, this, kind, this genre, this kind of work, the graphic novel, is quite popular among young people. They can not only encounter and learn Benjamin Lay's ideas, they can actually see how he did it. They can see how he confronted people. They can see what it looked like uh, inside that Quaker meeting house when he spattered the slave owners with blood. I mean, you can actually visualize that. You can, you can form that image uh, in your mind based on the powerful art that, that David has done. So, so, so this book, I think, has had uh, a lot of success. Uh, we, we are very happy with it. It was just published in November. Uh, we've gotten uh, very strong reviews. We're looking into getting it translated into uh, other uh, languages. And I might also mention there, there are other um, projects about Benjamin Lay. I've been working with uh, a dear friend of mine who happens to be a distinguished playwright named Naomi Wallace. And we have written a play called The Return of Benjamin Lay, which is uh, another way of presenting this extraordinary figure and his... Uh, uh, his power, his impact on history. So there is this Benjamin Lay juggernaut out there, and I'm doing everything I can to bring this man back to public memory. So important. I have one more question that I want to ask you. It's a big one, but I just want to quickly follow up. Just It just 
dawned on me to ask this question. Is there any evidence of understanding or knowledge of Benjamin Lay in the early generations of abolitionists? Like, is John Brown familiar with him, William Lloyd Garrison? Can you talk about some of those figures and how much, if anything, they knew about Lay? You know, it's interesting because uh, Lay was um, repressed by his fellow Quakers, and he died relatively early in uh, the tr- within the trajectory of the abolitionist movement. He died in 1759. In 1758, the Quakers had taken the first step, uh, basically saying that Quakers could no longer be involved in the slave trade. They didn't say yet that, that Quakers were, were, could not own uh, slaves, but they did say you can't participate in the slave trade. Benjamin knew in 1758, and he had the satisfaction of this before he died, that this was really the first big step and that eventually Quakers were going to abolish slavery. So, so he died. But in the 1790s, Quakers and, and others who were involved in a growing abolitionist movement were looking for their own genealogy. So they reached back to Benjamin Lay and they they revived his memory. In fact, uh, Benjamin Rush, the Philadelphia physician and abolitionist and signer of the Declaration of Independence, was the first biographer of Benjamin Lay. He wrote a a piece about Benjamin Lay in 1790 that was published in one of the newspapers. Uh, This was then picked up by other abolitionists. Lydia Maria Childs wrote, Uh, or kind of rewrote uh, a a biography of Lay. So he was known reasonably well among other abolitionists. Uh, I'm sure that John Brown would have respected him uh, in temperament, if not in tactics. Uh, Benjamin Lay and John Brown had a lot in common. So, So what's fascinating is that Lay had a real presence in the abolitionist movement, but after the Civil War, with the rise of white supremacy and the professionalization of history, that's when he really began to become unknown. So, so yes, the early abolitionists, many of them did know about him. Thomas Clarkson, the most important abolitionist in Great Britain, had read Benjamin Lay's book, who, who can, he considered Lay to be a very important figure in the origins of the abolition movement. But a lot of that got lost in the later 19th and early 20th century. So now it's up to us to bring this guy back and make him relevant to our present and our future. And to that point, Marcus, it's really, it's, it, I guess what you're sort of getting at is that it's not about the individuals. It's about sort of reclaiming a radical lineage, right? It is an entire lineage that is in a, in, in a sense been suppressed that we are trying to sort of unearth and make relevant for today so that we can understand that it does directly connect. And it goes back a couple hundred years, in fact, what we're all talking about, what we're all fighting for and, 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 you know, our ideals and everything, they didn't just come out of nowhere and they are part of a lineage, a radical tradition. And we're kind of the living stage of this radical tradition. That's absolutely true. And this was one of the main points of the Minneheaded Hydra, that the struggles that we see in our time are very old. Uh, people have spent their precious heart's blood for those struggles, uh, and that, in fact, uh, there, there is a deep and long genealogy. I mean, for the longest time, we thought the working class movement only began with factories. But it turns out the workers of the world built the plantations, sailed the ships, and created capitalism as a global system. Uh, and they were fighting hard in resistance as they did that. Their stories need to be part uh, of of our history. So yes, it is quite profoundly about a genealogy of the present. Uh, and this is the this is the hard work of history from below. It's a very rich history, but a lot of it has been repressed. A lot of it is still out there to be recovered. There are a great many people that we need to know about. So uh, if this podcast does anything, I hope it'll encourage people to look into the history of previous fighters uh, on subjects that are dear to you in the present. Absolutely. Okay. Last question. Um, I just want to ask you, well, I want to say it this way. You know, I went to public school in the United States. I would imagine most of my listeners, uh, if they are in the U.S., probably did as well. And 
you know, I learned about the triangle trade, you know, from a very young age, right? We saw the little map and the little triangle and okay, well, here's Europe and here's Africa and here's the the new world and this is how it goes, right? And so it's like you have a, you have the sense that you somehow know something about this, right? But then as you really begin to learn about it, you realize you know nothing about it. We don't know anything when when we're taught in school, right? So you don't connect it to capitalism or to race or the construction of race or the creation of what we now call global capitalism, let alone, you know, primitive accumulation and all of the other, you know, terms that we would use in analyzing this. So I want to just give you a chance to speak about the importance of contextualizing your particular area of expertise for younger people, whether they're your undergrads or even in high school or younger, contextualizing it so that they understand it's not just a triangle. Right. This is how the modern world was born. You know, Eric, one of my favorite uh, moments in teaching history from below is when one of my students sort of gets indignant and says, why was I never taught this before? And I always say, well, that's a really good question. Why were you taught this other history and not this one? Whose interests did it serve that you were taught this old top down history? Right. So it's not merely a matter that you are ignorant. It's that your ignorance has a structure that was put there that prevents you from seeing more about the things that you're supposedly learning. And of course, the triangle trade is a very good example of that. That's an abstraction. Right. That's just something you draw on the board. That's an abstraction. It makes it hard to see that we're talking about real people in real conditions, real circumstances, making real decisions about how to accumulate capital, about who to oppress, who to kill, who to work to death, and the other decisions made by people about how to fight back. So we've got to have these, uh, these, these human histories in order to really see the depth uh, of these struggles and to get beneath the abstractions and the simplifications that we learn earlier in life. So, so for young people, if, if, if they can grasp this idea of history from below, I think it would be uh, tremendously valuable because then, like that worker who reads history uh, that Bertolt Brecht write about, you can ask really good questions. Yeah, George Washington was the master of Mount Vernon, but who built Mount Vernon? Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of enslaved Africans. So that's, that's the history we need to know about. Marcus Redeker has been with me today. He is a distinguished professor of Atlantic history at the University of Pittsburgh. MarcusRedeker.com is the website, M-A-R-C-U-S-R-E-D-I-K-E-R. MarcusRedeker.com. You can follow all of his stuff, get copies of all of the books, give them to the young people in your family, in your life. It will be a tremendous source of information and hopefully inspiration for everybody. Marcus, thanks so much for chatting with us today. Really appreciate it. It's been great, Eric, and I must say, I really really appreciate your emphasis in this discussion on younger readers and learners of history. Thank you for that. Thank you, Marcus, and for all your great work. Listeners, viewers, as always, thank you for the continued support. We will chat again next week.